Hey, Steve, can you talk a little bit about some of the uh, head coaches you worked for before you became a head coach, guys like Matt, Greg, um, Lordy? Yeah. I mean, just what, what did you take from each of those guys? We, I don't know that I could uh, tell you exactly what I took from each one of them, but, I, I mean, obviously I, I've stolen like every coach has from each and every one of them. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about uh, Matt Painter and, and Greg McDermott, but, I mean, Matt Doherty was National Coach of the Year when he was at Carolina. So um, you just try to take – uh, the things that, that they do and do well that fit your personality and take those with you and then obviously um, put that in into ex, you know execute that within your program and then those things that maybe were better for their, their personality or maybe they felt like you you know you should play a lot of zone and you're not a zone person you just leave that behind um, but you know it's it's like a it's like a master's class in coaching when you coach for or when you work for such good coaches. So I was uh, I was extremely blessed and fortunate. Um, but with that being said, I always was very careful with uh, choosing my jobs, you know, because I always wanted to be with people of high character and obviously be with good coaches because I always wanted to learn. You stayed at some of those places a long time too. You weren't like a one or two years and gone. Was it important to sort of? put some roots down and, and learn from those guys and develop and would you kind of, kind of talk me through the, your Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I've always been very calculated with the jobs that we've taken. Like, um, and, and I get it, the, the coaching industry is so fickle at times um, that sometimes you have to move quickly. For example, Western Kentucky, I was there for a year and I hated that because the people there were fantastic to me. It's a great program, but when you get an opportunity to come to Oklahoma State, you have to take it. Um, but with that being said, I always prioritize my family in choosing any job. And I never, um, for example, last year, I, I never moved my family to Kentucky. I allowed my daughter um, to make a decision if she wanted to stay and finish her senior year in Texas um, so that it wouldn't be her third high school. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's more important um, for me to have a uh, long lasting and loving relationship with my family and my daughter than to move her across the country and have her be angry at me, <laughs> especially with 17, 18 year old girls. So um, with that being said, I've always tried to um, take jobs with the um, thought process that I would be there forever. Unfortunately, as coaches, you're not allowed to be there forever. But when the opportunity um, for my for myself and my family came to advance, I, I've always taken it if it was the right opportunity. What well, 20 years in his assistant, why did it, in 2020 the Texas A&M uh, Corpus Christi job, went, why was it important for them to make that jump to be a head coach after you know, being an assistant for so long? Well, I mean, to be honest, that's the first one that offered me the job that I wanted, right? And um, at that time, um, you know, we had, we were very, very successful at Purdue. So it was hard to leave. I knew what we had coming, which obviously has turned out to be a final four run. Um, but when you're in coaching, um, at some point you have to bet on yourself. And I tell this to young coaches all the time. Um, you have to bet on yourself and you have to go be able to prove it. And uh, so I felt like that was the right time, um, especially for me um, because you know, my daughter, she had graduated and she, she went to college, Caroline, she was in college at Edwardsville playing soccer. And my mom was, was ill and she was declining. So it allowed me to, to get back and be around my family and be with my mom um, for the last two years of her life. Um, so um, it, it just was great timing. It was great timing. Besides good coaches, is it a correct inference that you know a lot about the post position because most of the guys you've worked under, they've been head coaches. They've been really good post development guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, each person that I've worked for have their strengths, right? But obviously at Purdue and even at Creighton, I mean, we had uh, we had Justin Patton that was drafted. He's, he's more of a, a modern post than he is a Zach E.D. low post, but yeah. Um, Matt, With that being said, they, yeah, I mean, they all, yeah, they all were good coaches and, and, and played through the post, right? And the best shot in college basketball is the layup and the dunk. So if you can play through the post and you can get easy baskets and opportunities, it just makes sense to do so. Um, but with that being said, I also, you know, coached Jaden Ivey and Carson Edwards and those guys, and those guys were great offensive guards. So I've been blessed to be around a lot of really, really good players 
um, throughout my tenure. What but, was it about Oklahoma State that just drew you to the job whenever you heard about it? Well, I mean, as I said out there, I mean, this is this is home to me, you know, to be back in Texas, Oklahoma region and and uh, be able to compete in the Big 12 Conference. It's the best conference in the country. And you're giving yourself an opportunity to compete for a national title every single year. If you're competitive in the Big 12, you're gonna have a chance to compete for a national title. So um, if you're gonna do this and you're wired to be a, as a competitor, you wanna put yourself in a position to be able to win a national title. And, and obviously that's, that's, what some, that's something that can be accomplished here at Oklahoma State. That's been proven before. Your quick, turnarounds, your quick turnarounds, coach at Corpus and then obviously Western Kentucky. With obviously good players help, but what's the keto quick turnaround? <laughs> yeah, good players. Like you, you said it. Like this ain't rocket science. Um, you know, you got to you got to do a good job in retaining the guys that are currently on your roster um, that fit with the way you want to play and, and and are there of the right character and and have enough talent to get you where you want to go. But then you've got to also fill the roster in with with guys that, again, have the requisite talent, but also have the right mentality. Because obviously you look at this locker room right now, you gotta have the right guys in the locker room, and that's the most important thing. Um, that's 1A and 1B is talent. You mentioned from a player standpoint, what about from a staff perspective, building your staff, what's that been like for you? Well, I mean, I've gotta make some decisions here. I'll meet with uh, you know, maybe some of the guys that uh, were on Coach Boynton's staff. I know some of, know some of them from my years of coaching and uh, then just kind of make the best decision uh, for, for us moving forward. Obviously, I've, I've done this for a long time and have a lot of people that have worked with me and, and even worked for me. So, uh, you know, just like players, you've got to have guys that are uh, um, of high character, of high moral standard, and then are going to work extremely, extremely hard to help Oklahoma State get where we want to go. You don't have, uh, Steve, you don't have big shoes to fill from, a, from an on-court success basis. But Mike Boynton was perhaps the most beloved coach uh, at this school. What can you do to, to uh, get yourself ingrained into the to the athletic department culture, the community, all those things that he was so good at? Yeah, well, Mike, Mike Boynton is a good man. He's a good man, and, and he's a good basketball coach. It, whether or not his success um, translated to the level um, that was expected, that's not for me to decide. But uh, in terms of answering your question, I mean, everywhere that I've been, I've been a part of the athletic department, I've been a part of the community, and uh, that's important to me. I mean, my son's gonna be running around Gallagher Iba all the time, and I'm sure he's gonna wound up in, wind up in somebody's practice at some point, and they're gonna kick him out, but that's just the way I've always, I've always done it. Like, I can't um, ever think of myself any differently than the cross country coach or the wrestling coach or the equestrian coach. I mean, we're all in this together. And to be very honest with you, um, those guys have had really good programs and, and I need to learn um, from them, just like hopefully, you know, they might want to learn from me. So we're all in this together. What did you learn from your last two stops? You know, especially that might help you this first year. Patience. I think patience is always the biggest thing. When you take over a job and uh, you walk in the door and you've got three, four, five guys maybe in the transfer portal and you're looking around and you're saying, man, I don't really have a roster, um, you know, that, that, can be, uh, that can be tough. It can be nerve wracking. So um, I've always been calculated in, as we talked about a minute ago, in, in my coaching moves. But I saw, I've also been very calculated with who I've recruited, where I've recruited, and make sure that they were a good fit. So um, just got to be patient, again, to make sure that we fill this room with the right people. When you don't have a base to build around, when maybe you do have a lot of guys in the portal that first year, does that change how you look, what talent you look for, how you recruit? No, it does not. It does not. I mean, you're still looking for guys that have a high level of talent and a high level of character. And... Uh, you know, maybe you don't find those in day one or day two. It might be week three or week four. It might be week eight or week nine. But you've got to keep turning over the rocks and you've got to keep doing your job until you find those people. Because ultimately, um, and I've never believed in shotgun recruiting. And what I mean by that is just shooting a big open uh, shot and see what happens. Like I, I, my staff and I will put an enormous amount of time in, in investigating to making sure that we fill this uh, program with the right people. And you talked about it a little bit before, but with the college landscape changing so much in the last six years, especially you know NIL, how has that changed things for you, how you go about your business? Obviously, 
been very different from how it was in 1995 when you started, but especially here as of late. You know, it's funny, it actually hasn't changed that much. And I'm going to say this, and, and some people won't understand it, but when I started in 1995, I coached at an NAI school in current work. Well, there, um, you gave partial scholarships. So I may so say it's 20000 to go to school there. Well, I may give you 10000 and I may give him 10000 but he's going to get a $10,000 academic scholarship, and maybe you don't. I'm not knocking you by any means. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so when all of that, you know, is factored into the decision, do you give him the scholarship and not you? Because now, hey, I can go get another guy, whereas you're going to say, hey, no, I need $20,000. So that factors into your decision. My point in saying all of this is when you get into NIL opportunities, those decisions matter. And you have to look at what their market value is. You have to look at what they think their market value is and figure out somewhere in between as to who's a fit and who's not a fit. And uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. We've just uh, we've, we've started to move towards a little bit more of a business model. Do you anticipate any of that being a bit different now being out of Power 5 school rather than, you know, Western Kentucky, stuff like that, where it seems like more prominent? Sure, of course. Yeah, we're going to have more money here, guys. I mean, <laughs> you're in the Big 12, and, and that's part of, obviously, part of my job is to raise and, and find more investors in our program. Like, you're investing in individuals, but really you're investing in Oklahoma State basketball, and that's the way we've got to look at it. It's a necessary evil, if you will. Um, the rules have changed, and, and so we've got to embrace the fact that these guys are – able to to be compensated for their name image and likeness and let's compensate them well especially the guys that we want to retain you guys are welcome to continue down here but just let you know chad weiberg is answering questions upstairs hey, chad's a lot cooler than me guys <laughs> yeah, I hurt my feelings. Chad, chad mentioned your texas roots and what he said you've obviously alluded to san antonio and current word of your kind of corpus what what do you feel like the importance of those Texas roots are for you as you start to build and try to get this program going? Well, I mean, I, I think we're understating, you know, my Oklahoma roots, too. Like, when I was at Stephen F. Austin, um, I had a young man from Star Spencer High School. I had a kid from Seminole Junior College, Percy Green, Edwin Tatum. And those guys were good players for us, first team all league. So, um, you know, to this day, Percy Green's a, 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 you know, he goes from being a player to a friend. And uh, his son's a, a, a junior college freshman now. And so, like... I've, I've recruited this region forever, and uh, we've had some really good players along the way from the state of Oklahoma and from the state of Texas. But like when you look and you walk through these hallways and you look at the NBA players, where are they from? They're from Texas. And so we've got to do our, our due diligence and, and you know, drawing a, a circle around Stillwater, Oklahoma, whether it's a two to 300 mile radius and find the best players and, and then go get them and get them here and then develop them. And, and uh, help them to get where they want to go so we can get where we want to go, right? Um, so I, I think it all rolls in together. I think it's more of a regional fit than maybe just Texas. What does the situation look like with assistant coaches? Do you know if some are staying? Are you bringing any in? I haven't gotten that far. Right, yeah, I'll meet with some people this week um, from the previous staff probably. And then obviously I've got uh, a lot of people in mind that uh, um, have either worked with me, worked for me, or just have been friends, you know, um, um, in the business for, I think I've done this 28, 29 years. So um, that'll all evolve here in the next couple of weeks. But again, it's like players. You have to bring in the right people. So I'm in no hurry to say, hey, I've got to have you here by Monday or Tuesday or any of those things. Steve, because of, of the regional ties that you talked about and, and the time that you were coming out of college in 95 or, or coaching around here in, in 04, what are, what's, kind of your big picture view of what Oklahoma State basketball is, kind of not just not just in the present, but over your life. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the pinnacle, right? Like, I grew up Big 12. Like I, I followed the Big 12. I aspired to play in the Big 12. Obviously, I was not good enough to, to be a player in the Big 12. But, yeah, I mean, this, to me, growing up was, was big-time basketball, big-time athletics, and obviously it still is that, you know. The, the bar is high. Coach Iba, Coach Sutton, all those guys have set the bar extremely high. And uh, now we've got to get back to where we were.